Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Paul Carlson. I am Vice President, General Manager of Cold Chain at Emerson. Um, welcome to NAFM and to our E360 breakfast. Uh, we're pleased you can be here with us. Today, our Emerson panel discussion is automating the commercial kitchen. Uh, during this morning's event, we plan to debate and discuss the factors surrounding automation in the kitchen. Uh, we have an excellent cross-section of industry representing OEMs, end users, and food safety. Some of the key questions we'll be asking our panelists this morning cover, is the technology that is being pushed toward the kitchen addressing today's labor issues? Does automating the kitchen begin inside the facility, or does it cross over into other parts of the food service supply chain? And how serious are operators about using data? Is the market mature enough for a connected kitchen? Moderating our panel discussion this morning is Emerson Vice President of Solutions Integration, Paul Hepperla. Paul will be introducing our panelists and exploring how technology is transforming today's commercial kitchen. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for today's event, Mr. Paul Hepperla. Thanks, Paul. Good morning. I get the pleasure of introducing the panelists to start with, and so uh, I'll go to this. So we've got about an hour, and we want to leave about 15 minutes for questions towards the end. So this is going to be a lot of packed conversation, and uh, my job as a moderator is to stay out of the way and keep everybody on track. So first, Chuck Guerin. Uh, Chuck is the Vice President of Controls for Middleby, and he leads the company's electronics control design, innovation, and procurement strategies. And this includes working with all the various Middleby divisions on connected solutions, automation, and user interface design. Prior to that, Chuck was one of my co-workers. He worked for 18 years at Emerson selling custom electronic controls and manufacturing services to that food service market. He also served as the president of Flamingo Wire, a custom fabricator of metal store fixtures and displays. Prior to that, he founded Interad, a company focused on database search systems and automated fax services. Chuck earned a bachelor's degree in business administration and marketing from the University of Minnesota, Carlson School of Management, and connoted by his little pin, he is a certified food service professional. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> Next to him is Jim Kleba. Jim is the director of equipment engineering for Wendy's. And Jim brings more than 35 years of experience to the food service industry in that role. He's worked there for the past five years. In his role, he oversees a department of professionals responsible for equipment design and approval, kitchen layouts, workflow, and labor standards. Over the course of his career, Jim has worked in a very variety of food service roles. These include cook, restaurant manager, food service consultant, equipment engineer, research consultant, field service manager, kitchen engineer, and plant management. Collectively, they help them gain a comprehensive understanding of the industry. Jim earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Maine. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> and our insider, Matt Toon, is the general manager and vice president of Cooper Atkins, which is now part of the Emerson world. Uh, it's a Connecticut-based division that provides real-time perishable cargo tracking and monitoring services. Over his career, Matt has risen through the corporate ranks at Emerson. His previous titles included director of marketing and business development, Vice President of Oil and Gas, and General Manager and Vice President of Vilter. It was in the latter role where he led Vilter industrial refrigeration teams to record sales and profits via new product development and expansion into untapped markets. Matt earned a bachelor's degree in computer science from Indiana State University. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. So the first question we want to get to is, how did you get here? So a background of how you ended up in food service talking about Automating the kitchen. So we've gone through the background, but we'll start with you, Chuck. How did you get here? Um, well, I started uh, actually at, at Emerson or Control Products initially, uh, selling consumer products, and uh, moved into their OEM custom food uh, controls design area, which I found extremely satisfying because it was a whole new industry where you could help them create a, a control and a, and a and an for a new application that uh, would create a new product. And so every time I'd get to go to a restaurant and then see that control on a new product that, uh, that customer, it was exciting and fun. And, and uh, so it allowed me to stay there 18 years and enjoy that part of it. 
what, uh, what moved me to Middleby was, was kind of that next generation of our challenge where uh, Middleby was looking for a, an idea to consolidate and look at it, managing their control strategy along with some of their innovation and, and new technologies. And uh, they were all very independent organizations, independent companies, and the thing that they're looking for is trying to find a way to consolidate and work with more collaboration between the divisions. And that's what I get to do, and it's a lot of fun. Good, good. Jim, you got an extensive experience in food service. So now you're talking about Automy in the kitchen. So has that all contributed to that aspect? How did you get here? Um, <clears throat> The needs of the, it's kind of funny, the vision of automation I had was an equipment manufacturer is quite different than the vision I have as a end user. Um, a lot of ma equipment manufacturers look at uh, automation and IoT internal to the equipment and all about the equipment. You can look outside of the equipment and see how it works in my operation. That's what automate, that's where the win is, fitting automation into my operation. Good, thanks. Matt, you're a newbie to this industry, uh, about a year now in food service, but you came from industrial, yeah. where there was clearly a lot of data and a lot of automation. Uh, so what have you seen in this industry now that's, that's different or unique, or uh, you know, how did you get here? Um, I think really from our perspective, it's about brand preservation. Um, and as we talk about Wendy's and other major uh, food service organizations, really getting that data out of the devices, specifically as it relates to food safety and food quality, um, and realizing at the end of the day, it's got to provide value, um, efficiency, automation, um, but most importantly, us recognizing that we're providing brand preservation back to the uh, back to the end users. Okay. So over the last number of years, there's been a lot of conversation. Back 20 years ago, it's called machine to machine. Now it's called IoT, but as we talk about automating the kitchen, I think it takes a different connotation, and I think everybody in the room probably has a different definition of what that means. So, Matt, for you, when you think about automating the kitchen, what does that mean? Um, specifically, as it relates to the Cooper Atkins business, um, everything we focus on is really around pyrometers and sampling uh, food temperatures, um, and then also in the cold storage, um, walk-in freezers, under drawer counters. Uh, it's really getting that data back to make sure that the food is safely cooked. Um, also tying it back from a quality standpoint so that we have repeatable process. Um, and then alarming on the refrigerated systems. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to connect all of these devices. Um, just a discussion at the table this morning where you know, we have walk-in freezers being left open for hours at a time. <coughs> Is it directly contributing to a food quality issue? Maybe not, but there's definitely the opportunity for us to link these systems together, specifically at Emerson's core, the refrigeration side, and start to drive efficiency and cost savings for the, uh, for the business. So to me, it's about really trying to connect all this. The data's great, but if we don't have actionable events to that data, it, it's for nothing. Outcomes versus data? Yeah. Okay. Jim. From your perspective on automating the kitchen. I always like to start with the definition of what automation is, and Webster's de definition is to replace or enhance human labor with machines. We've done a great job of enhancing, but not replacing. So food service, you know, your, what you just went through as far as food safety, right. a lot of stuff there. You know, at Wendy's, we introduced a DSG, double-sided grill, 15 years ago for food safety. That was automation. Um, food quality. Automated, you know, you go simple as a basket lift. That's a food quality automation. Um, employee quality of life. Self-cleaning combi ovens. Believe me, we cook a lot of bacon in my restaurants, and that is a huge automation in my restaurants. Um, Wear washing, we actually consider an automation instead of working in a pot sink. So these are all things to improve the employee's lifestyle. Um, then there's customer experience. We have kiosks that we're putting in, ordering kiosks that we're putting into a restaurant to improve the customer experience. Coke freestyle machines that are out there now. So those are automating for the customer's sense to sake. Where the future is, is replacing human labor. That's the future of automation food service. And that's what we're focused on. I don't need to take 10 minutes out. I need to take a body out. Okay. <clears throat> and, and I want to come back to that in a second. Chuck, for, for <clears throat> Middleby and for you when you think about automating the kitchen, um, I, I agree with Jim that there's a lot of things that Middleby is working on with regards to addressing some of the future concerns that he's looking at, specifically trying to reduce the number of bodies that are in there and, and also reducing food waste. So I think that automation can help 
with regards to those aspects by uh, helping you to retain employees through uh, rewarding uh, employee training systems. And that can be initiated by the control, it can be initiated by process automation in the, in the, in the restaurant as well. But certainly the, the one thing that Middleby is really concentrating on is are aspects that can potentially tie not only equipment together, but tie it to the other processes in the, in the, in the kitchen. Tying it to the drive-through, the, the headsets, the things like that I think are very important to try to initiate and look at ways that we can, again, reduce that, the, the amount of hours, the amount of time that it takes to do something which would eventually help, hopefully reduce the headcount, but more importantly, even to reduce the speed to service. And um, so I think all those things are, are working towards that. So you, you think about the kitchen as a food factory. How are you helping make the business case? And, and you know, I think that we're all on a journey, and most of the business cases I've seen have been pretty straightforward and pretty simple, and it's usually about the data and some cool graphing and things we can do. But uh, as we move down this path, Jim, to your point, that's great, but unless you're taking a body out, you're not helping me. I, I heard yesterday, one of the statistics I heard was, if you take six seconds out of a drive through operation, it brings about 1% to the bottom line. Yep. Yep. So six seconds, um, yeah. that's the goal, uh, effectively, and do it over and over and over again. So Chuck, how are you helping make the business case? Well, that's a, a good point because there's a cost, obviously, to, to do some of these things. You either have to add sensors, you have to, uh, you're putting information and data in the cloud, and then there has to be a, some kind of actionable uh, response to that data. Um, so, you know, the things that I think when we look at uh, uh, the business case, we're, we're evaluating what is it going to cost to you know, add those things to the potential equipment. And, and uh, you know, so for instance, just even the Wi Fi connections, we look at connected equipment, and I, there's a cost to add connectivity to a piece of equipment, but it's pretty minimal nowadays. Um, and the challenge is actually of getting through Wi-Fi and a lot of the restaurants are starting to, uh, that barrier I think is coming down as well. Um, so once you get a lot of pieces of equipment connected and you're getting a lot of cloud, uh, a lot of data in the cloud, you can then start to really get actionable items on service and, and menu pushes, uh, things like that, that obviously we're working with on a lot of our equipment. Um, but then how do I look at paying for those costs? Um, is there a monetization aspect that we can either, ability uh, either looks at um, but you know the data is essentially owned by the restaurant too, so we right. have to, we, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. Yeah, Jim. I, so, if you had an overwhelming, compelling business case presented to you on, on this yet, I'd just go straight to what my uh, objectives are for the year. Uh, so, we always ask somebody, "What are you bonused on?" This is what I'm bonused on. So, if I meet this, <laughs> I make my bonus. There you go. Um, automate customer non-facing processes to enable removal of a position from the daily staffing. So how many That's people do you goal. have on staff in that back, back office operation? Uh, minimum staffing starts at five and we go up to 14, as de depending on the business yes. of the day. So when you talk about eliminating one hat, is it off the five or off the 14 or somewhere in between? Uh, ideally off of the five, off the okay. minimum staffing, and okay. it carries throughout the day. Matt, business cases and presenting them to, our, to, to your customers. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear your objectives. Um, Part of what we try to base our business case off of is, uh, you know, we, we watch the market right now. We know what's happened around food safety. Um, the individuals that I typically communicate with, you know, that tends to be one of the main topics that ends up coming up because, you know, it could result in significant uh, market cap losses. Um, so a lot of what we try to position around and what we see as the real value it's the, what's the cost of not doing it, specifically around food safety. Um, and that's really the, the, the value proposition that we try to you know, work towards is, again, automating that, that temperature monitoring through the cooking process to ensure and preserve the, the brand of the, of the franchise. Okay. So to that end, we talked about data in the cloud. We talked about data a few times already. Jim, is it more valuable to you to look at it after the fact or in the real time? Um, we just need alerts. My managers in the stores don't have time to look at data. They don't know how to look at data. Yep. Actually, most of your service techs, when we call them for service, they don't have time to look at for data either. Uh, they're having a hard enough time keeping up with the calls. Um, so the data without you, actionable. Exactly. Um, it has to be actionable. Yeah, it does. It's useless. So we have to create a, the best user experience that nobody ever logs into. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing about data is where does the data reside and who owns the data, which I'm sure we're going to have a long conversation on as well. <laughs> yeah, well, let's go there. Um, in terms of data ownership, how do, you, how do you view that 
first gem from, from a retail perspective. And I'm going to talk to Matt and Chuck about that as well. Actually, I have customers too. My customers are franchisees. They don't want to share their data with corporate, no less with people outside of corporate. <laughs> Uh, so that, that's what it comes down. They see value in the data, and they want to be they want to be monetized for that data. They don't want to pay a subscription for you to look at the data, and that's really where the difference is. They see the data as an asset that they're generating, and they want to get monetized for it. So, Chuck, somebody buys a piece of your equipment. Do they own that data that's coming out of that equipment? Generally, yes, that's the way they assess. Okay, and and then to Jim's point, what's your perspective on on? data ownership as it goes down the path. I, I look at something, I'll use the term derived data. If Middleby has their Turbo Chef oven and creates some incredibly powerful uh, metric or algorithm that comes out of that, I'm assuming that you'll say Middleby owns that and, and the insight that you might gain from it. Yeah, we would be looking at trying to, the derived data that we would, would look to, to get, but we have to have the original data to be able to do that. So how are you working with end customers to create that uh, synergy or that cooperation? We have to provide a, a, a value case to the, to the restaurant that makes sense that it is worthwhile for that franchisee and the, and the corporation to share the data with us. And that, that value proposition has to be in the form of, of reduced service calls, reduced service warranty costs, potentially going to the labor aspect if I can find ways to, to show you that that data can turn into actionable items that reduces your labor costs. Um, especially when you look at things like you know, connected equipment that, that actions down to potential helping with training and behavioral uh, changes that can help with the organization. And, and I think that's a, an area that I know we've been exploring. So does iconography and, and ways to communicate. So it's not <coughs> keeping employees is great, but there's turnover in this industry. So everybody knows that. So that training aspect, if you can train somebody in, in 30 seconds versus a half hour on how to use a piece of equipment, does, does iconography and, I mean, we're a food service is filled with bells and lights and buzzers. I think part of that's because it eases training. So, I mean, Jim, from your perspective, is there, a, is there an evolution there with how you train your, your employees and, and the speed of which you can do that? Well, yeah, we're never gonna buy, buy all of one brand's equipment in our kitchen, so I know everyone doesn't believe that. <laughs> um, so what we need are, we want access to the, the GUI. We want access to the graphic user interface. So we can customize that for our, each of our own pieces of equipment. So we have a Wendy's GUI, and it can be applied to everybody else's equipment. That way, they all have the same user. And if you all talk about, hey, we, if we, with my company, we all have the same user, uh, the GUI is the same uh, user uh, interface. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not buying all one brand's equipment, so I need access to give multiple brand's equipment the same GUI. Do you have style guidelines or things like that with that user interface that you could just work with manufacturers to say, here it is, implement it? We'd, we'd rather do it ourselves, but yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Are you building those in-house? Uh, yes. That's interesting. And, and I think Middleby looks at that strategy with, with the, the aspect that absolutely the, the restaurant chains, they want to be able to have one login for, for all that information. They want to consolidate that data to make and infer a variety of decisions on their own. Um, Middleby is creating a Middleby Connect, which has you know, the ability to a lot of information to go to Middleby Connect. Um, and the fact is that we want to have an open API to to other systems, mm -hmm. other cloud systems, and be able to share that information. It's important, because uh, we know that we're not the only one in the kitchen. We'd like to be, but we're not. <laughs> Matt, from your perspective, data is a unique uh, term. Um, do you have customers that want to retain three or four years of food quality, food safety data? Yes, we do, um, okay. specifically around HACCP. Um, is there a liability required? to that? Um, <laughs> yeah. I think that there probably is. Yeah. Um, again, we had this discussion earlier, <laughs> earlier during breakfast. Um, you know, I can definitely see how it relates to at a franchise level. You know, Jim, from a, you know, corporate level, maybe you don't want to see all that data. Um, so I, we get that. Um, I do think it's interesting that you guys are building and working internally to create your own interfaces, and it definitely ties back to, in order to do that, there's got to be some type of an API strategy put in place mm -hmm. in order to share the uh, connectivity across all the different uh, pieces of hardware that, that you have in the, in the kitchen. So uh, IoT, Internet of Things, obviously a very commonly used buzzword. Jim, more specifically to you, and then, and then I'm going to talk to Ch Chuck and Matt about it, but there's this range of full-scale implementation and tire kicking and experimentation. Where do you think Wendy's is on that journey now? And where do you see yourselves in the next year? Uh, we're in experimentation right now. Um, again, going back to automation, 
um, if you automate the mechanics of a process, you still haven't eliminated a body. You still have the brain of that human operator that you have to automate as well. And that's really where I see IoT coming in. Um, in particular, where we see the greatest need for IoT, which would be the biggest thing for us, and this goes back to your speed of service comment they opened with at, at the drive through Can I know what the customer is going to order before they order it so I can start cooking that before they get to the restaurant and have it ready fresh for them when they get to the restaurant? So what, how do we do that? We have to look at lots of data. You have to look at transaction history. Yesterday's, last week's, last month's, last year's. You've got to look at transaction data real time at stores around you. You have to look at traffic in the street in front of you. You have to look at weather. You have to look at school events. You have to look at cars coming on your parking lot. You have to look at people coming in your building. You have to take all that information, crunch it down to say, cook two hamburgers. Mm -hmm. What's your customer's perspective? So. Uh, do you envision a state where uh, you got a license plate reader and facial recognition where you uh, go, our hey, customers are, uh, yeah. I'd love to get there, but I don't think our customers want us to go there. Um, we, I mean, the, the technology is there today. With the visual recognition technology out there today, I can recognize you. I can say, hey, I know you as you, and this is what you ordered last time. Or you can scale it back a little bit and say, hey, I know you as a demographic, and that demographic typically buys this. Or go and scale back a little bit farther and hey, there's a big person or a small person, that small person is probably a child, therefore I have an adult order and a child's order. Uh, until you get scaled back one more step where it's just bodies coming through, and that's where we're at now, just bodies coming through. So that prediction, is it, is it a three second head start? Is it a 10 second head start? Is it a two minute head start? It, we're, I'd, like it to be, I'd like to be in the 30 second area, but won't be there, it'll be more in the five to 10 second area. But that makes a huge difference in our operation. Interesting. Chuck. On that journey, you know, you've got Middleby Connect mm -hmm. uh, in, in your role now is there to help, I think, consolidate and direct some of this. But think about that, that, that journey. Where are you on it? Well, uh, Middleby Connect is one aspect, and I think that we're also sort of experimenting. Well, I, I shouldn't say experimenting. We definitely have a full-fledged process. We've got a lot of machines. We've got, uh, uh, we're monitoring uh, for some chains already with regards to that. But most of it is really related to looking at data, the menu pushes, and service-related alerts. So the next generation, the next, next step, I think, with regards to that is um, taking a look at some of the things that Jim's been talking about. And I've got a bunch of data going up and down between, the, between a, a machine and a cloud. Now I want to have that information go up and down and also connect across to various machines within the, within the organization. And other, again, kind of to what I alluded to earlier, other processes. So you go to your drive through you go to your your other systems and you tie all that, some of that data together so that not only is he predicting kind of what might be ordered, but it's telling the controller, it's telling the equipment, it's telling the operator, put fries down or cook three hamburgers and do that automatically. Um, and I think that's where we're gonna to start to see some real benefits of connected, connected equipment and connected systems within the kitchen. I mean, I think a simple example of that is if you connected your equipment under the hood and had that tied to the hood, you know, the hoods right now turn on and operate. There are systems out there that look at smoke and infrared to determine how much, but if you knew what your equipment profile was below the hood and you see things turning on and turning off, you could effectively tie some of that information together, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Matt, you know, journey for you guys I think is probably a little bit different, but it's evolving as well. Yeah. Uh, is it more of a technical or technological journey or is it uh, application? Um, we've been, you know, working towards this now for specifically in the food service side for about three years. Um, the biggest challenge I think that we have is, uh, you know, it comes back to security and connectivity. Um, and I think it may be a security, not to lead the witness too far, but, yeah. um, you know, that, that's, that's a bit of an issue. Um, so working through that has its challenges. Um, the other thing that I think is, uh, creating some problems and it's interesting, Jim, to kind of hear your approach, but as we work with other large QSRs, you know, Chuck's got his stuff connected, they've got their stuff connected, we've got our stuff connected, we're all in this race. Um, and now he's got to deal with 12 windows and how we're all pulling this into something that's meaningful. Um, it, it's just kind of interesting, I think, of how this is gonna all shape up if we were to look out five years from now. Um, and some of it, I believe, is getting on a common architecture and really starting to come back as we talk about the APIs and. Who is empowered? Is it you to create the GUI, or is it us? Or you know, what does that what does that look like? To me, I think that's the biggest challenge. It's actually 
connectivity, and then from a uh, technology standpoint, how are we all going to get this data together? Because we're all in the race. And to me, that's the, the challenge, because we're all trying to stake our, our foot in the ground and protect our own spot. So that may not be the best thing for, for Jim. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's where there's a, I think still a disconnect a little bit in the industry around end user. It's, it's not, a, not necessarily a disconnect, but I think there's a, there's a yin and yang and tug of war going on right now. Jim, um, I'm sure you guys don't care at all about security. No. Good, all right. So that's solved. Um, uh, but no, seriously, as you look at security. Sec uh, security and even more important for us is stabilization. Yeah. Uh, especially when we get out to rural areas. Um, so anything I need, anything I do in my restaurants has to be scalable across the network. And if I have poor stability in rural areas, it's not scalable. Yep. Uh, so we've got to think about that. Um, how do you get around that? You limit the amount of times you communicate outside of the restaurant. So you do most of your communication within the restaurant, within, between the equipment and the restaurant server, and you only reach out of the restaurant multiple, maybe two or three times a day. Uh, that's how I see you get around that. Uh, but security is the, anything I try to bring into my restaurant that talks outside of the restaurant, IT shuts me down real quick. Yeah. How, do, how does your uh, IT group play with the franchisees? And is security become their responsibility or is it still because you own the brand? Is it a, is it a how does that tie together? We own the brand, but we also, um, require certain piece of equipment within the restaurants like POS and things like that. So we have our job is to ensure that those are secure and stable, that the items that we promote and we recommend. Okay. Yeah. Chuck, there's, I think there's two aspects of security. The way I framed it up is you build it secure and then you have to keep it secure. So from that aspect, there's probably two different approaches with that, but from a Middleby perspective, how are you addressing the, the common question and concern of your customers around security? In just about every instance so far, it's been a case-by-case -case basis, working independently with the IT departments to identify the proper strategy that they want to utilize to ensure that the security is, is there and adequate. Um, certainly within our systems that we're building, we have a, a security protocols that we're, we're initiating to ensure that we minimize that, uh, that chance of anybody being able to get in. Obviously, every, all of our s systems, and like a lot of them now, are, they're only going out of the kitchen. They're not, nobody can really drill, drill down. Uh, we go up, we grab new menus, that kind of thing, and bring it down. Um, but to the stabilization effort, that, that kind of also goes to the support effort of this. The minute you connect a bunch of equipment uh, to Wi-Fi or even cellular connections, but particularly Wi-Fi, um, I do a menu push to 2,500 restaurants, 10% of them don't get updated. Who manages that? Who, you know, who determines that it was Wi-Fi or the equipment was off or that kind of thing? Who pays for that, that, that service call? Um, because that becomes a huge cost potentially to, the, to an automated connected equipment. So, so it's I'll, I'll follow that up with a question. And, and Jim, you and I talked about this a little bit, and I know I've talked with Chuck and Matt at different times, but you have a brand new piece of connected equipment. It's out in the field. It's operating just fine, and the Internet goes down. Is that piece of equipment broken? No. Ideally, no. The equipment, the equipment should not be considered broken because it simply doesn't have an Internet connection now. We don't, want the, we don't want the Internet connection to be one of the fundamental uh, applications uh, required to run the equipment. Jim, how does the operator view that? Uh, I mean, if it's invisible to the user of the, of the piece of equipment itself, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And it's just might, might be a manager's note onto the server or something, hey, we lost connection from here to here, right. that's fine. But if it takes the equipment down or there's an alert on the piece of equipment, that's more troublesome for us. So the recommendation so, would be don't put the alert on the piece of equipment if it loses connection. And, and only, if it's a critical, <laughs> only if it's critical to the operation of the piece of equipment. Exactly. Food safety. Yeah. Matt, are you, how are you and your teams dealing with security? Um, there's some benefits to being part of a, a large organization. We have a very robust uh, uh, process that we go through. So any of our new product development, you know, securities in two parts of our stage gate process. Um, and we have the resources within Emerson to kind of do deep dives, uh, not only from a hardware standpoint, but also from a connectivity and software standpoint. So it's just built into what we do um, day in and day out. Um, and it's nice to be... Uh, um, part of Emerson to have that type of backing to do that. Um, I wanted to make just one other comment. It's, it, it, as you're trying to reduce heads and through automation, the other issue, going back to your prior question, Paul, it's 
one of the issues that I see right now just within the, the industry is we all like to think that th these systems are plug and play, and they're not. So getting everything set up um, and provisioned and ready to go when it hits that floor is got to be key because you, you're not going to have your resources to, okay, now I got to get back in and get it all set up. So, you know, as we continue to develop from the technology side and the stability standpoint, it's also got to be in the, the term I use with my team is, you know, it's got to be like Sonos. You got to be able to hit the button, it connects, and we're rocking out. If it's not that easy, it's just going to drive headache for, uh, for the end users. So that's a lot of our focus right now um, and our product development. It's making it completely seamless. And then again, from the uptime standpoint, it's, it's, it's got to work. Yeah. So from it, it, interesting you know, provisioning, but there's also the need for over the air updates. So you think about firmware and regardless of whether you're using a Linux kernel and all of a sudden there's a new upgrade of that or Bluetooth or BLE or Wi-Fi and there's a new standard because somebody realized there's a security hole or a security risk, means that you've got to now go back in and update thousands of pieces of equipment. I mean, Chuck, how do you plan to manage that? I mean, connect the equipment. We have a, an ability to go and, and up, uh, upload new firmware uh, and firmware updates. And generally, we, we coordinate that, obviously, with the restaurant chain to, be able to uh, do that appropriately so that it's not going to result in any downtime, of course, of the operation. But That's new, new equipment is, can be bidirectional. How, do you see a, a path to deal with legacy equipment that may not have that capability? Um, in many cases, some middle equipment is upgradable to, to be connected to the, to the internet and to middle connect or to another system if necessary. Uh, but it all depends on, on the equipment specifically. But we are definitely looking at legacy equipment as well. Okay. I know we're going to be running out of time here as it goes quick, but um, Jim, your perspective, obviously much of this effort is to tie together man and machine. So we could have all the machines automated, but we still don't know how your employees are using them. So how do you, how does Wendy's look at that perspective? Will you get into potentially employee tracking to know maybe not who the person is, but where they are and what they're doing? How do, how do, you, how do you see that moving forward? I can take that question spin it a little bit more, more into a vision that I have. Um, so we have all these people, one of the, the, the biggest nightmares in QSR, and I know there's a couple of the QSR guys out here I can see in the audience, you go into QSR and all you hear is these beeping and buzzing and loud noises and it's, it's not customer friendly. What if every piece of equipment communicated to a server and that server communicated to the operator via headsets? So only the fry operator heard drop one basket of fries. Nobody else heard that. Customer didn't hear any beeping or buzzing. So what if all that communication was handled discreetly through, through headsets and all the pieces of equipment talking? Also, having technology in the piece of equipment, so when I pull the last piece of chicken out of a holding drawer, or the second to last piece, there's a weight transducer or something there, and it goes to the headset of the fry operator and said, hey, you're down to your last two pieces of chicken. You might want to drop some chicken. That's the future. Yeah. Which requires probably a 10x to a 50x increase in the amount of sensors and the equipment that exists today. Would, yeah. I mean, Chuck, from, from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, do you see that evolution starting to happen? Are you putting more sensors on equipment? We definitely look at more sensors as, as a way to accomplish a lot of those, those ideas. And we've been exploring ideas al along that line with regards to, again, kind of what I referred to, tying the multiple systems in the restaurant together. The equipment has to be able to talk to some of these other things to be able to, to, to the headset, for instance, to, to be able to give that, that uh, ability. And at the same time, the operator needs to be able to talk to the equipment through the headset, potentially, and, and be able to tell the equipment uh, I want to go into a setup mode or something like that. Um, and the whole idea is if we can try to reduce not only the, uh, the you, know, you want to reduce the ability for the person to have to learn every piece of equipment and, because they can do so much more by simply asking for it through their headset. Um, and uh, so definitely Middleby is looking at uh, strategies around that. And the cost-benefit relationship is really what it's going to come down to and how much sensor and equipment we're going to add to it. But. Matt, do you ever see being able to move away from the human process of probing food by sensors or uh, other ways of, of perishable tracking? Yeah, uh, working with some of the uh, equipment OEMs, we've looked at embedding you know, temperature probes within the plenums and things like that to take some of that uh, human factor out of that. I, I do think that that's something that we can get to in the, in the future, but as of today, it's still... 
and pyrometers. <laughs> so, but, I think, but, but if I can just yeah. real elaborate on that, yeah, go ahead. I think one of the things that we want to look at is, is, is hand temperature is difficult to get around from an automation standpoint, but can, can the equipment, can the processes in, this, in, the, in the restaurant do a better job of understanding, tracking, and rewarding the employees for doing it right kind of thing? Right. So yeah, game, game theory taking, taking hold within that environment? Yeah, and I think that's a good point. So uh, obviously we talked a lot. Changing behavior, to your point. Ch exactly, changing yeah. behavior. Yeah. <clears throat> Jim, your, your vision has many pieces of equipment all working together, which means we're all part of a large ecosystem. Matt, you talked about it before. Uh, there's a turf battle going on. We're all trying to create differentiation among ourselves as manufacturers. The end users are trying to create differentiation, or the, our end users, the, the, the QSRs, the, the C stores are trying to create differentiation among themselves. So nobody's going to own the entire industry. But how do you see this playing out? What do you see the roles becoming? We hear from manufacturers a lot that say, yep, I'm going to offer a connected device, but I really like a transaction sale and I want to keep my hands clean, so here you go what everybody, some, somebody does with it. So how do you see this shaking out? Put, um, your, put your vision on. Yeah, no, it's good question, Paul. Um, if I had to paint the perfect picture, it would be that we were able to create some type of common architecture that just make things a little bit easier. Um, and ultimately, we're all in the race, and I think that that's also part of the problem, that I still see it being a bit disparate. And, at the end of the day, we're still not really serving the end user. It's still a bit selfish in our view set of what we want to accomplish for our particular business. Um, and that's going to be tough. And it's going to be tough for us to kind of pull it all together and, and, and work to get to that, uh, that common platform. But I, I do believe that if we can get to um, something that is low cost, um, easily connectable, and starts to span across your question back to Chuck, where we can easily um, take legacy systems, tie everything together, uh, I, I think that we can get there. But it's not there today, um, and I think that's going to be the key for who kind of, I don't want to say owns because no one's going to own it, but who really enables the, uh, the end users, it's going to be based upon the uh, architecture. Chuck, tell Matt why he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Well, Do you I, see any differences? <laughs> well, I think architecture is a big, a big question. And, and it's, if we do have a common architecture, obviously the equipment can communicate more easily. And we can communicate with other systems more easily. That, so I, I couldn't agree more in that regard. Um, and I think from, from Middleby's standpoint, yeah, they want to be able to, you know, okay. and to be honest, We'd love it if, if everybody want, you know, said, hey, let's do a Middleby Connect system and we'll rebrand it for Wendy's and um, you know, allow everybody to, to put their equipment, their equipment on it as well. But that's not likely going to be the case all the time. Sure. Um, so somebody else is going to have that solution. Wendy's is going to create their cloud. They're going to want to not only have equipment connected to it, but obviously all the, these other systems, and they've got to be able to talk. And we are a ways away from that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just the architecture of getting equipment to talk to each other. It's also the architecture of... How do we collaborate? Even just the the messages between these systems, and I think that's that, that's a tough tough thing to do. It is, it is. A lot of R and D involved. Yeah, I want to open it up to questions to the audience. There's two folks here with microphones, Robin and Paul. If you have a question, <coughs> um, I'd ask you to. Yeah. Go ahead. Good morning, guys. Great conversation. Um, I'm curious about where you see the value chain versus how this is going to be paid for. So uh, I see value for the manufacturer of the equipment. Um, we get better warranty data, analytics on what's happening to our equipment inside a store, which is very difficult to get today. Um, the operator obviously gets a piece of value. We can make their, uh, their uh, operation more effective and hopefully increase their return. Um, the chain obviously has some advantages here. Um, does this become a checkbox that is, is kind of a necessary evil to play? Or is there a value stream, and maybe this is to Jim, is there a value stream that the uh, chain is actually willing to pay for here? Where do you see that going? Labor savings. You know, it all starts. Food, food safety, you have to do that. Yeah. Uh, and there's ways around food you know, you can do it manually, but you know, you can address food safety. Uh, so you have to always do that. But right now, if I put a business, if I put a business case together and, and, and present it to leadership, if it doesn't have labor savings, it doesn't go anywhere. Even with all the soft benefits. 
J Jim, is there a role in that value chain uh, with leasing? So the manufacturer owns the equipment through the process and yeah, now... That's, that's a great conversation. Uh, food service operators don't want to own equipment. They want to cook food. Yeah. That's all they care about. So if there was, if equipment manufacturers looked at it, the business a different way and say, hey, I'm going to lease you a piece of equipment and that grill for every hamburger I'm going to charge you a half a cent. Now I know what my P&L looks like. It's predictable. Yeah. Yeah. You own the responsibility for, uh, for maintenance, being the manufacturer because it's the least piece of equipment. That's really, a, that's, if you talk to any food service operator, that's what they want. They don't want to own equipment. They'd rather take their money and their assets and build additional restaurants, not add, add equipment in the restaurants. Yeah. I agree, the paper use strategy is something that is very interesting. Yeah. Questions? So I'm going to, if there's no question, oh, got one right here. Oh, yeah, I, I got some laryngitis, no talking too much to customers, but I just, <laughs> when you talk about trying to um, integrate, NAFM data protocol has been going on for 10, 15 years with very limited, and we talk about the turf wars. Um, you know, I still got my Betamax player, so I'm still waiting for VHS to go away. <laughs> but can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, those are issues that have really been tried for exactly these same reasons and have really gone Little to nowhere. Yeah, I think NAFM protocol has been talked about for a long time. There's lots of people in the room that have probably been part of those committees. I mean, Matt, looking at um, standardization around technology and protocols, do you see it becoming something like NAFM or more around an API? And, and where do you see that going? Um, I'd say it's probably going to end up more on the API side because, again, it's so many people that are competing in the in the space, um, it's going to be hard to kind of pull it all underneath one umbrella. Um, so definitely as far as getting the data um, and then being able to put it in some usable form, you know, an API side, I do think even more down to the basic hardware side, though, that's going to be where a lot of the magic is. And I do think that the standardization of that communication protocol is really what's going to drive the connected portion of it. Getting the data out, quite honestly, is easy. Um, it's getting with the it. data on a common platform that's cost effective. It, you don't want 12 gateways sitting in your, in your mm -hmm. store. Um, so to me, it's about, again, one, call it portal, in order for all of these connected devices, whether if it's yours, Chuck, um, or someone else in the room's piece of equipment where we can communicate on one common platform, one gateway, in order to get the data up so that Jim can do something with it. Um, that's that when I talk about standardization of architecture, that's what I'm referring to. Chuck, are you guys using the AFM protocol? No, we're not. Why not? <laughs> it's the same reason they're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. question no. in the back of the room. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Again, guys, thank you. Uh, great conversation. Matt, like you, I'm new to the industry. And um, I guess I'm curious. I think you were touching on it. I'd like to know not about the standard, but why is it not being adopted? I actually come from a finance background where those, uh, probably about 40 years ago, that was standardized. Um, and I think anybody in the finance industry would tell you the benefits of how those financial trades are, uh, all the manual processes were you know, taken away, uh, natural matches on trades. I mean, the entire financial industry works on those standards and would have collapsed if it hadn't been developed. So I guess my question is, we understand this from the benefit of that standard, but why is it not being adopted? What do you think the barriers are and how do we get past them? Yeah, good question. Um, I think a lot of it is, is just the maturity of where we are with the connected kitchen. I mean, we talked about it, we're at the trial, you know, or the infancy stage for a lot of us in the room. Um, and quite honestly, I think if you look at the space, it's just adopted and matured a little bit slower than um, some other areas. So I think that's part of it. The other side of it is, again, we're all competing for this connected solution. And with that, we're starting to do things what we think is the right way within this one group. And I think that's where some of the struggles still tend to be is um, we're still looking at it from that side. 
Um, and I also, you know, think as we look out into uh, the, the very near future, um, you know, all of us in this room right now are connected right now. Um, and all of us have headsets and on the flight down here, we're listening to, you know, a book or, or some music. So some of it is, is just as looking back at what technology is really available to us right now and actually what's the most cost effective. And, you know, I have my opinion of what that is. Um, and I believe that, you know, most of these devices are going to end up being connected via Bluetooth. Um, and that starts to give, again, some common infrastructure from that side and then ultimately back to the gateway. Or in the store. How do you, how do you want to get the data out? Is it just going to be at a store, local level, or then push back out um, and, and what that frequency is? So one of the questions, too, about that adoption of the standard, we have a pretty complex, from a manufacturer standpoint and from an end user standpoint, a pretty complex channel with distributors, dealers, consultants, all playing a role, and, and so Chuck, do you get enough information back as a manufacturer on how your equipment is operating from those end user environments? No, in fact, a lot of times we don't even know where the equipment is. It's sold by a distributor or a dealer, you have no idea where yeah. the location is, and um, you know, so you, you know, we've had discussions on forced registration, we've had all, you know, that kind of thing, but you know, not nearly enough, and so obviously to, to the point they made earlier, the manufacturer has a, a vested reason and interest to want to have connected equipment, you know, service warranty, you know, analysis, trying to improve their equipment from big data analytics of the of all the sensors and th uh, input uh, data points. Um, so yeah, we'd we'd love to see more more information, and the only way we can really do that is by connecting it. Back to the original that other question that just came up, uh, the the other adoption issue is simply nobody has really made a, an appropriate financial case to justify let's all work together <laughs> because again we're all we're all competing we're all trying to figure it out uh, nobody said and, then, and there's also not a not a, 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 a safety or a, a compelling critical infrastructure issue that's a that's a problem yet to force all of us to say we better adopt some system okay. common architecture I mean I got 150 people in my ID department we can handle and we only have six or seven main pieces of equipment in my kitchen I can handle making those communicate it's the small users that you guys have to deal with. We need common common architecture, yeah. not the bigger users. Jim, is 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 all this a nice to have or a need to have? And is that part of the reason why it, adoption it, of whatever protocol might be out there hasn't taken off? It's it's a nice to have. As I, as I mentioned, you know, food safety is always a, a top pri criteria. All we focus on right now is labor. At fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, I got to start closing restaurants. So, so a follow-up, I'm just curious on what you guys think about this uh, from a technical perspective, but you know, today I can buy a $100 controller for my home that will run anything that I have on any platform communicating in any of the three or four major protocols that are out there. Is this issue of a common platform really an issue, or has technology kind of made it, made it agnostic anyway? The, the, the problem to your question, though, is we're not doing that in the stores. The, the technology is there. We just haven't pulled it in. I think there's also the aspect of legacy equipment. Uh, dealing with many manufacturers, you've probably got some custom proprietary protocol that's Modbus or Canbus or something else that's there. So it's not in a uh, format that people can take and use. So, I mean, it, Chuck, it, it, you, pr as, I mean, you have a conglomeration of different companies, and as you've walked your way through those, I'm sure you've seen just a massive difference in across the board of how that's yeah, been obviously done. within our own divisions yeah we have different protocol data protocols that are communicating and you mentioned can bus mod bus um, is a, a, you're right it's difficult even with our own group to sometimes you know collaborate together but we are working to, to do that and maybe right. connect is one of the things that we're doing to, to, to help with that that's where I think that common architecture is, is an issue because when you think about the you know legacy equipment that's out there it's massive and so maybe there's an approach that says from new equipment moving forward offer an API, uh, and that becomes standard, but, uh, you know, trying to put Sonos on a receiver uh, from 35 years ago is a little bit different than buying new speakers. Um, my, my question is, or, or comment is, is that I think you've made it all too complicated. I don't see <laughs> that it works any better now than it did 40 years ago, and this is from the service side. 
We get paid to make things complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and they do a good job. <laughs> I'm only teasing. But, you know, it's, we, it's you a know, great we really, point. We really haven't addressed some of the service issues. You did a little bit earlier, but service is one of those major things where you can, just through advanced controls, if we can provide better diagnostics to the service operator when he gets to the, even when he gets to there, and if even it's a not connected piece of equipment, simply on the touch screen, it tells him a lot more information as to what happened, what is going on, what a step-by-step -step thing of things he can try to fix. Um, or for the operator to try that, to, to fix it beforehand. Um, we can do a lot more, even simply just with you know, graphical user interfaces. And then when you do a connection, you can provide some data background to that that can provide that operator maybe very uh, advanced knowledge of what to, what to bring on the truck or what to expect. And I think to your point about complexity, uh, one of the manufacturers we've worked with in the past has 330 data points coming out of an ice machine every three seconds but they don't have feedback as a manufacturer to understand what broke, when and where. So when we went through that process, the pump, which was their primary point of failure, wasn't monitored. So, um, so I think this is also a journey as manufacturers start to get more information, but you're right, we've, we've overcomplicated it because we're more interested in the data than the outcome. And if, to Jim's point and Matt's point, Chuck's point, we get back and focus on the outcome, what data is necessary to achieve that outcome, I think can help simplify things. Mm -hmm. Question? Paul, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the complexity of, you know, you know the, the massive amount of data that, that a single kitchen can, can generate. You know, as somebody that's been watching this for more than 40 years and, and was around at the inception of, of the NAFM data protocol, it's, you know, I mean, uh, Jim knows this. We've been having these discussions now for t more than 20 years. Chuck knows that, too. <clears throat> I see two things, though, that, are, that have changed, and, and, and I really recognize it at this show. Matt, you talked about how everybody's in the chase and everybody's trying to control the kitchen, particularly the big conglomerates, you know, middle B, well-built ITW, they've been trying to control, Electrolux, <laughs> they've been trying to control the kitchen. That's been their approach to it, right, Jim? Mm -hmm. I think they finally recognize they've got to go agnostic. Yeah, I mean, you said it earlier, Jim. You're not going to have one, you know, and the chains have been telling the, them this for, they don't buy that way. They got to play you off man, uh, well built. My, okay? my purchasing department wouldn't let me do it. Exactly. <laughs> there's the purchasing side and there's yeah. the spec side. So I think there's a recognition now from most of the major manufacturers that, I mean, I heard Rick Karen at Well Built say it yesterday we have to be agnostic. Yeah. That's a big change. That's a really big change, and that'll allow what Matt talked about. Yeah. The other thing is, you got the cloud now. You can actually throw all those masses of data somewhere. And, you know, to go back to the guy with the financial, you know, background, they had really big mainframes to collect all that data. We don't have that infrastructure, and we don't need it because we're too fragmented. So the cloud technically makes some of this stuff possibly possible. But as Jim said, then, you know, if you're in Keokuk, Iowa, and you don't have any internet, it's yeah. nonsense. It, it doesn't work. So. To, to that point, one of the calculations we've done in the past, 20 pieces of equipment, 50 data points, every five minutes, 10,000 locations, it's 150 terabytes of data a year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The question becomes, do you need it? What do you do with it? People talk about data analytics. I, I've yet to meet a data scientist, regardless of how good they are, take data from this industry without understanding the industry and make any sense of it. So you have to have an applied data rather than just a data scientist applied to a mass of data. They may not understand what it's going on about. Four million service kitchens that half the stuff is 20 years old. Yep. He said it's 1.4 million kitchens and 20 years old of equipment. So we've got a, we've got a challenge on our hands that I think is exciting and fun. Are we, uh, what's the time? Four minutes. Any, any last questions? Quick comment on service. Yeah. Putting service into IoT and giving service alerts is okay, but I don't want that on average cyclic life. That's useless. An average is a 50% is a of the time you're high, 50% of the time you're low. In order to have it really mean something, you have to add sensors, additional sensors into your piece of equipment so they're tracking things to track when those components are going to die, not just relying on the cyclic life of that component. Because yeah. um, if you rely on cyclic life, people are, operators are going to say you're replacing things too soon, they're going to lose confidence in you, and the whole program will die. So Jim, to that end, if you had a leasing model with additional sensors in that equipment, 
will the operator help bear the cost of using the equipment inappropriately or not doing the cleaning cycles when necessary or do we build that into the service model around that piece of equipment so basically you're cooking and that's all you care about but we're going to tell you that there's a little kicker if you're using the equipment inappropriately. Um, I always like to turn negatives into positives so can we can we give them a benefit for using the equipment property not hit them yeah, with a so negative. The, to yeah. Chuck's point earlier about game theory. <clears throat> yeah. Exactly. Reward the employees for doing things right. Uh, reward the employees for taking actionable actions on the alerts yeah. that are, so that we can keep that equipment up and running. Yeah. Any last comments uh, from Matt, Jim, Chuck? Anything, uh, any la last closing statements you want to make? No, it'd be interesting to have this discussion in three years. Yeah, see where it goes. <laughs> I think this is part, can become part of an ongoing conversation. Uh, we were talking about it as we got into the conversations uh, individually that we could probably spend three hours talking about this and the more input we get across the board uh, enlivens that conversation. So certainly we'll be taking a look at it from an Emerson point of view of, of how do we continue the conversation because uh, we think it's relevant to the industry, we think it's relevant to the manufacturers and the end users. So uh, I want to thank the panelists, Matt, Jim and Chuck, thank you for your time. Audience, thanks for your uh, listening and your questions.